Welcome to the Gate 7 International Podcast, your official English source for all things Olympiakos FC and Greek football. The first day of training is when I realized, oh, this is why they win the league every year. When I, I spoke with Kevin, if I'm going to sign or no for Olympiakos, he said, you are pretty good deal, like my friend. I can't speak, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> What's up, boys and girls? Gate 7 International back again on this hot, hot Sunday. I don't know about you guys, but it's 95 degrees here. I think that's 35 Celsius. So it's a hot day for us. Uh, it's going to continue to be hot the rest of the week. Pumped to talk about all these things, Libyakos. But first and foremost, Lambro Costa, how are you guys doing today? Good. <laughs> I'm doing all right. <laughs> I'm doing all right. It's, uh, What's the, happening? It's the dog days of summer. It's August 7th. I'm going to Greece in two weeks. So going to be in the stadium for a few games. So I'm excited for that. So just grinding out going the last few weeks before that. So, you know. Um, good Costa, feeling good there's my there's my opportunity to say subscribe and hit the bell because <laughs> my boys are going to be doing some vlogs while they're oh, out there shit. Match yeah, day vlogs. You, yeah if you haven't seen check out how good the fucking last vlog went three nil atalanta at home uh i was there they were good vlogs they were good it was vlogs, good vlog the atalanta was a good vlogs vlog. were good yeah <laughs> But I like yeah. this. Look at my eyes, DC. I'm only with my hot Olympiacos boxers. Well, it's hot in some way, shape, or form for you guys. Beautiful. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I love it. Well, guys, first and foremost, before we get into the good stuff, we've got some quick housekeeping. Uh, for those that follow on socials, Milestone, we hit 2K on Twitter. So thank you, all of you. Uh, next step is going to be 2K for YouTube. We're getting there. Getting very close, guys. So thank you all again for, for everything we do. Help us continue to widen the net. Let's get more red and white fans, more Greek fans, football fans in this community. Make it bigger and bigger and bigger. 2K on YouTube, that's the next benchmark for us. We're getting pretty close to 4,000 also on Instagram. So many more milestones to hit, and we just keep hitting them faster than expected. So thank you, all of you, for continuing to make this bigger. Uh, another quick thing. Guys, we got all of your messages, especially with the issues viewing Olympiacos for the Europa League uh, regarding streaming. For those of you that are outside of Greece, we know it is an absolute shit show. Uh, we, we are working on it. We are, guys, we are literally talking to anybody that we can, everyone that we can, uh, to try and get the ball rolling. Uh, with Cosmote, they don't have the infrastructure that Nova Sport had set up. Nova Sport had a very easy service. It costs, I think, about $9 a month. Or I think for, uh, I paid, I think it was 85 euros for the year, whatever that comes out to, if you paid it up front. And it was very easy. You had um, all the Nova Sports channels plus uh, Earth you could get. So I was able to watch basketball too. I think even Open, they even have now too, plus all the radio channels. It was very convenient through Aeon. Uh, Cosmote doesn't have the same service. So we are working on that. And uh, trust me, we, we guys, we know about Go Greek TV. Enough of you have complained about it that we're not, obviously we're not considering that as an option. I had a terrible experience with them for two years. I was looking at my email history, over two dozen emails when stuff wasn't working. So I also me, had that a, go, yeah. go Greek TV is like the shittiest thing like ever. I always had yeah. literally, it, it was such a jank system. It didn't work at all. The game would always lag at cr like crucial moments. I remember always. I would always set it up on my laptop and it sucked. And also, hello to all you guys dropping where you are in the chat. Great to see all of you um, from all over Greece, from all yeah. over Europe, from all over the world. There's always some Australians, too. Happy Monday morning. Unfortunate for you guys. We still have a little bit of the weekend left here in Europe. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. Ireland. As a check -in from, is that our first check-in from Ireland? That's incredible. Maybe. I think so. Yeah, That's I haven't fantastic. seen one before. I love that. That's fantastic. Everybody, oh, we got from Yanina too, country of my mother-in-law. Love it. Love That's it. Great. All right. One more quick thing for you guys. Uh, as you guys already know, Gate 7 International is not partnering with BetUS. 
uh, to bring new analysis and commentary to all of our Olympiacos discussion. Fueled with the constantly updating match props that we now get from Vegas oddsmakers, plus our sports analysis that we get from Scout, our next-gen data ana analytics. Uh, we're going to combine all of this to help you guys make some money and also fuel the discussion for Libyakos as well. But there's nothing like following the club you love and then making a little bit of money also on the side. So using our code Gate7 International, you can see it right here at the bottom banner. Use that when you set up your account at betus.com. Go to the description. You can see our link where you can click directly, go to the setup page, make your account. And then when you make your deposit, your first deposit, you get a 125% deposit boost. So if you put in 100 bucks, you get a total of $225 to start. It's a great boost, and we're going to be here to help you guys make some money. There's some opening lines already for the Libyakos game. Libyakos is a half-point favorite, so half, I should say half-goal favorite ahead of Slovan Bratislava, and it's paying out even money. In European odds, basically it's paying out at 2.0. So if you bet $10, you get $20. Bucks. And opening lines, that's pretty good, I think. It's a, it's a very tasty option for me. But, of course, we're going to wait till we see the player props before we give you guys our bets of the day and before we start going into what the good and bad bets are. There you go, guys. Bet US. You can take Costa. this one, Costa, if you want. You want to take Should we that? answer this question? Um, yeah. So, Zach V, welcome to the channel, mate. I'm just bringing up this comment here. Ari Costa Labra, I live in Athens. Where do you guys live and how is your English so fluent? Forgive me, I'm new to this channel. Um, fair question, mate. So, I'm actually born in the UK. I grew up in England, uh, from London. I live in Belgium now. Olympiacos fan since I, since I came out of the womb. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, here, here we are. The other guys can, can tell you their story real quick as well. Adi, go ahead. Yeah. Listen, man. Born and raised Libya goes from my Bapu. I live in Baltimore, in Greek town, Baltimore. So, I mean, there's a lot less Greeks here now than there used to be, but <laughs> everybody used to go to the Cafe Nio, watch Libya games, my Bapu included with them. So that's how I got into Libya Uh, And then uh, Lambro and I actually were, well, I was a master student when he was an undergrad. So, but we were at College Park, University of Maryland together. Yeah, I, I think we gave our first like handshake. The story is about Seba, but one of our it best friends, like we were doing a party for Adi graduating. I gave him an Olympiacos scarf that was like, I still have it. Know. Yeah, that was like one of our, uh, I don't know if I've mentioned that on the pod. That was like one of our like signature, like my boy, you know. But yeah, <laughs> as <laughs> you guys put it, I'm from Honolulu, Hawaii in the US. Uh, Honolulu, as they say in Greek, Hawaii, as they say um Olympiacos fan on for, this comment by the way guys the the wire oh, season the two fantastic. about the greeks anything about the greeks when you're at the location those are filmed in uh my family's warehouses for our shipping so oh, shit. All the, i'm dead serious all of that was filmed the offices that's filmed at our location so they kept just it a little honest. bit of uh a fun little tidbit for you guys really really fun stuff they actually had to replace the carpet <laughs> Because in the lat in the scene, the end of the scene when the guy goes in, I forgot who he kills, but uh, they got fake blood stained all over the carpets, so they replaced them. Funny enough. <laughs> That's just 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 to, ju just to clarify this, uh, yes, the wire is filmed in Baltimore. Is exactly what it is filmed. It's about Baltimore. Saying. It's it yes. <laughs> they did actually. Yes, there were. There's uh, some stories. There was a guy named Crazy John. Uh, whole story. We can get into that maybe on a boozing with the boys. But yes, there used to be back in the day. Oh, geez, boozing and the boys. We needed one of those. And with uh, George, our good friend, who's a Manchester United fan, it seems like he's probably boozed out of his mind with Holy Belcos and Manchester United in the current state they are. Uh, yep. Real but yeah, quick so tangent for we own this city. There is a Greek cop that was involved in that, but he's like the only good cop that ever came out of that. He took no bribes, nothing. So giving Greeks a really good name. Love it. Just wanted to point that out. And also, Zach, thank you for changing it up. Because usually when Greeks hear us speaking English, like, why aren't you speaking Greek? This is a Greek team. So props, <laughs> yeah. man. Props, man. I love that. Thank you. Yeah, there's been quite a few people who are just like, 
oh, I don't understand anything speaking Greek, but which is fair, fair enough. People stumble upon the show and they're a bit confused, which makes sense. But yeah, change of things. Um, yeah, it's I, great, I though, guess. Like, yeah, dude, 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 we're seeing so many new people. Like it's yeah, um, tons it's of really new people been, on the chat. It's been amazing. Well, the last the last week, ten days. Yep. For, for for the show, I guess. Um, not so great for the club, but here we are to talk about good things and bad things uh, when things are going good and when things are not going so good. But but yeah, it's been very um, borderline overwhelming. Like the uh, the amount of new subs coming in as well. Thank you. We're very very grateful to everyone. And here we are again, Sunday live. We normally go live this time every Sunday. For those of you that are new. Uh, we will be back next week or, well, as of tomorrow, we'll definitely be with you after the game on Thursday. Might be some preview before that as well. But, yeah, typically we are here, guys, 11.30 Greek time, around this kind of time on Sundays. We go live to chat to you guys to talk about all the latest. When games start as well on the weekends, we'll be here. So, yeah, keep up. Keep up with us. Thank you for all the messages. Thank you for the subs, the likes. Um, really appreciate it. We're going to talk about all the latest today, transfer news. There was news today about backroom staff. Again, uh, we were supposedly looking at a technical director some weeks ago. Then that went that went very silent. Yeah, from you know looking at the former Barcelona technical director and bringing in two Italians, Sabatini and and De Sanctis, and then. You know, Carapapas came out and said we're speaking to 20, 30 different technical directors, and and then it just went it went dark. Like there was nothing about the back room. Had a managerial change since then, of course. And today there's news, uh, there's news out, which uh which we're gonna get into. And don't miss it, guys. Like, stick with us. Ari's done a great analysis of what he saw, what we've seen from the last game uh, with uh, with Slovan Bratislava, how that compares to the game against uh, Maccabi, how things have changed already, starting to change with a new manager. So stick around. Um, that's coming up uh, as the main course, let's say. Yeah, so shall we talk about the backroom stuff? We had um, we have New York Nick, Evan Fournier, um, supposedly coming. <laughs> oh, no. Oh no! What? It's not New York Nick Evan Fournier. It's Julian Fournier. <laughs> Sorry, it was too easy of a joke to make. Um, Julian. That's what Fournier. I thought this morning, though, man. When, when I read the paper and I saw the name Fournier, I was like, <laughs> "Hang on a minute! This this, this has got to be a gimmick because Fournier <laughs> made made those comments. When was it? I think after yeah. the Euroleague or before the Euroleague final. He was like, Olympiakos is the only club in Europe that I'd really love to play for, et cetera, et cetera. But yeah. it's not about Evan Fournier. We it's got uh, Isaiah. Yeah. We got Isaiah Cannon at the shooting guard position. So maybe maybe Fournier for another year. Yeah. So it's Julien Fournier, as they say in French, uh, formerly of Nice, uh, the southern French football club. Beautiful, nice on the coast, nice beaches, Mediterranean style. Um, and they built a decent project there. He's been there for... I think 10 or 11 years. And before that, he was at OM in Marseille. So he's more um, he's more Mediterranean French than Northern French. Like, uh, you know what I mean? So maybe he's got a bit better of that kind of Greek mentality. They are a bit more Mediterranean-like, I guess. Um, and yeah, he was working with, uh, I think a British consortium took over Nice to kind of run yes. the football club. Yeah, so... Like Sir blah blah blah. I don't know his name. There's like always like it's always Sir in British, which I don't get how you get it. Like the Queen anoints you Sir or something. I don't know. Let's not get into it. Anyway, so he's been working with them there, and actually they had a huge falling out like in the media with the coach Rudy Gatier. Is that his name? He's now the the coach of Paris Saint Germain. So Paul Saint Christophe Christophe Gatier. Gatier. Yeah, they had a huge falling out where he like basically went to the public and was like he plays like shit we have really good attackers and he uses them poorly and like they were just shitting on each other in the press um and he was like i'll still be here next year but the coach won't blah 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 and now they're both gone from nice july 6th um so yeah that like he recently was let go and when we we're talking to our friend marcial supposedly there's some sort of connection with greece like the son um 
the sun lives in Greece or there's some sort of connection there. And if you guys remember really well, one of the strongest teams that went in for Costas Chimicas back in the day was Nice because they 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 knew him pretty well from the son of um I think his son's a scout. Yeah, the scout son. So I don't know the profile of the scout, but um yeah, Costa take over. You obviously have done more research. No, so uh I think the the story is his son was live, living out in Greece. I think he, the son of Fournier is a, a scout that's been sent to Greece. And he told he told his father about Timikas, which explains the strong interest that Nice uh, were showing for him uh, that summer. It was Nice, Napoli and Liverpool that, that were looking at, at Costas at the time. So he's not a stranger to, to Greece in that respect, nor Olympiakos, but also it should be said that this guy Fournier, he's been at he's been at Nice since 20, 2010, 2011, I want to say. So he's been at Nice for a very long time. Nice was you know, not not a particularly successful club, let's say. Um, but if you look at where Nice has finished in the last the last few years, over over the time that he's been there, they've been getting into Europe. I think they've finished fourth or fifth some years. That they're in the top half of the table and not far off the the top three the top three berths. So it's a team that's getting into Europe. Um, I'm trying to remember some signings that they've made. Like notably, I think they bought in Ben Arthur before he went into Paris Saint Germain. Balotelli was a signing that they made some years ago. I think even Ronnie Lopez loan to Nice was under was under the watch of of this. Um, of this guy Fournier, who in Nice was was a, a, I think not a technical director, but like a director of football. I think it, it seems position. like the translation is off because some of the French were like uh, they were confused by the title that the Greek media was throwing out. They're like that makes no sense for his role. So it's always right. confusing. I remember we we got caught up as well in like the name and role of Francois Modesto, like chief scout, technical director. Mm. Like, let's just let's just call it what it is, though, because right now the the setup in 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 Olympiacos in the back room. I mean, they call Vasilis Torosidis a technical director, but he was, in my eyes, acting more as what Avram is supposed to be doing now which is what Kulis Durekas used to do um what um what the departed Savas Theodoridis God rest his soul what he was doing in the back room so uh, there's also been some some word out in the press as well in the media in Greece that Vasilis Torosidis may be on the way out or they might be looking for a different role for him because he hasn't been on the bench if you noticed he wasn't on the bench the other day so i it, i think it's good that this discussion is opening up again like if we want to be a modern club we have to we have to set set up the back room like a like a modern club we lost lina suluku as as general director we we've lost some really key technocrats and so i um, I'm not going to say like you know bringing in fournier is the right move or the wrong move but it's a guy that clearly has experience clearly knows greece like has knowledge of greece um and he's he's done well he's done well at nice let's see let's see there, there seems to be there wasn't any denial or you know someone from olympiacos coming out and saying no nah, we're seeing another 30 people we haven't decided yet so i'm i'm happy that finally this topic is kind of coming back to the fore because i think we've been talking about it on and off you know, on camera uh, and between us that what happens like we were interviewing 30 people and then all of a sudden nothing so it's back let's see this is a story to follow uh, in the next few days uh, and uh, and weeks but of course priority is the game on on thursday but i think that's pretty much all we have in terms of fournier i don't know if there are any comments in the chat maybe some people from from france or i don't know what we do. Before we get into anything regarding the game, we do have a couple of questions here. Uh, some of it's regarding players. Some of it's uh, regarding the back room. Uh, did you? Did we want to address a few of these first before we move on? 
<laughs> oh my gosh, Sale. Maybe Torosidi can teach Oleg how to cross. Guys, actually, Oleg's crossing is not nearly as bad as it, as it he used made to be. one good cross last week where Tequino headed over. Do you remember that? Does anyone remember I that? I do. Or, yeah. There was a little <laughs> one two with Zinker Nagel, and it was like, oh, wow. He could have 50% crossing accuracy, but going one for 17 over the summer last year is will always <laughs> stick with him. It doesn't matter. I remember uh, oh, Oleg just like matter. putting a he like preseason training in Austria, and there were bird migrations, and he just like would kill birds down with his fucking terrible crosses. <laughs> Vasily, uh, I'm not in the studio today, or well, my attic because uh, <laughs> my mother-in-law is here and she's sleeping upstairs, and the kids are still awake, so I'm doing this from the bedroom. Oh. So you know, <laughs> improvised studio, but um. I think it's really interesting, the Fournier move. I, uh, again, don't know much about him, but he's passed through the halls of really big clubs. I think uh, I think French teams get a bit shit on by like general football fans because PSG runs the league, blah, blah, blah. But Nice and Marseille are like really big football clubs. I, um, I think we need to reiterate that. Also, I think Turkish clubs also get, they're, of course, a lower level, but if you see how many followers they have and millions yeah. and millions, the pressure is also really big in those Turkish teams. No relation, but just like a comment I would make um, on that. Um, but yeah, I think it's interesting. He's definitely sold some really good players and brought in really good players as Costas brought like brought up. So I don't know. Let's see. Uh, this is an interesting question from Michali, uh, Michali Senior 9. How do you find the fact that we haven't had any kind of statement from Marinakis or Carapapas, even though so many changes happened? Is that a joke or something? Uh, and well, before I share my opinion, I, I also want to make it clear because we saw some comments like this on social media over the course of the last week, I'd say. A lot of people asking, how come they haven't said anything or no, have they... No one said anything really that much from uh, the ownership about Martins, so on and so forth. And I'm going to be honest with you guys. I was going through like other clubs uh, that were in similar situations, trying to find out, talking to fans of other clubs, trying to find out similar situations. And it's actually more common than you think for a club to just try, kind of try to move on as quick as possible. Unless it's like a very, like a disaster class scenario where like things are falling apart or like when Rome, I don't know if you guys remember Roma a couple years ago uh, when um, Di Francesco resigned, like at that height when they were about to burn Rome down, like that's usually when somebody comes out to say something like we're in a bad state, but it hasn't like, we're not kicked out of Europe yet. You know what I mean? It hasn't gotten bad to that point. So it's to me, it's not super surprising that we haven't heard anything yet personally based on people I've now spoken to other situations I've seen it's a lot more normal than you think it's not just a Greek thing but I don't know how you guys feel about this question oh everyone knows my opinion Costa you want to go first before I give mine because I think you're more on Adi's level <laughs> <laughs> I, I, well I'll, I'll try and be the in-between look we saw Christian Garebe at the press conference when they when they unveiled a new manager. So I think Karebe was speaking for, for the board in what he said. They thanked the former manager. And then before the game against Slovan, when he was interviewed pitch side, he reiterated that again, thanking the previous manager, Pedro Martins. And so, yeah, to kind of go back to Ari's point, I can't really remember a time Marinagis has really come out on camera to make a statement. Uh, it's something Kokalis maybe used to do, but not in not in crisis situations. The way it normally goes in Greece in a crisis situation is that a statement or things that have been said to the players at, uh, at the training ground when the chairman turns up, some of those statements leak to the press and they get out and they're discussed for, for public consumption. So that's normally the way it works. Now, you know, does... I think I think the priority for the club right now is just okay. Uh, make sure make sure we're playing in Europe this season. There's work to be done, and I know I 
I know I went off on one on the last episode when I was talking about not comparing Nottingham Forest and Olympiacos, and I'm not doing that when I'm going to say this, but it does seem like they're very busy right now in the back room. Like Martin Nagus is busy with Olympiacos. He's busy with, with Nottingham and he's very hands-on with Olympiacos at the moment because we don't have that technical director, because we don't have those technocrats helping to run the day-to-day of the club. So for me, it doesn't really come as much of a surprise. Uh, it's interesting to hear what Ari says as well in terms of how other clubs deal with those kinds of things. Can you imagine like, I mean, Arsenal fans over the last the last few years with Stan Kroenke, yeah, the uproar or uh, Daniel Levy at Tottenham, so like, they don't come out and speak publicly about what's gone okay. wrong or it's not really like so. I kind mm-hmm. of like I'm I'm with you I'm with you on that point. Do we want the club to be more progressive and kind of like answer our questions on these things and say what the plan is and um, maybe is it realistic? perhaps not right now i think the priorities are elsewhere that's what i have to say i kind of disagree though of course though with your point about them not being pro- progressive you see the son of uh of stan Kroenke is like there oh he he does come out and they make statements and he does come public and say a few things and also they invited cameras into their team for a whole season if you guys haven't seen arsenal did this all or nothing on amazon and Tottenham did the same thing. They're they're quite public, I think, about how they're run as football clubs. But really, my main point is we're so fast to be the first people to to be out there during the win or to post or blah, 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 to make a statement. I think we also need to be out there during the difficult times. And, um, like, we just need some leadership Um like someone to come out and explain what is going on. I was really disappointed with the whole situation, how it was handled, how when you lose 4-0, like Olympiacos did at home, the manager should be fired that night, should be let go. There should be a statement from the club. There should be a message from someone saying, we have let you all down. This is a disgrace. We'll build it up from zero. There's not really been that. So, okay, that's fine. And also there's not a clear technical structure right now at Olipiaco since the departure of Francois Modesto. So um, I'm not really sure what the role is of Christian Carambe. Like, is he scouting players? Is he looking for players? Is he negotiating with agents? I don't really think that's his role. So um, so the, the real question is, who is sorting this out? Who's going to rebuild Olipiaco? According to a Todeca GR article from Nikos Kotsis, it was after the massive loss with Maccabi Haifa, uh, Marinakis brought in Karapapas, um, Avram Papadopoulos, and Vredzos. So in your moment of crisis, Christian Karambe was not in the room. I think that was really interesting from the article that was published. So really, those four, to me, are probably the decision makers right now at the club. Who's doing the scouting and everything from what we've been told and what we understand is the scouting and data analytics department basically presents cases and then it's presented to the board to kind of try and negotiate it. Um, yeah. So um, that's all I say. I'll, I'll say the main point is we deserve someone to come out and basically one apologize Two, they should have refunded all the tickets. Three, the tickets for the next game should have been free this past Thursday. The tickets should have been free. That's my opinion. You disgraced us. You lied to us. You should you also begged the fans to come to the stadium um, and watch shit football, which we've watched for over a year. You should refund the tickets. It was a disgrace that they didn't even refund the tickets. People actually pay their weekly wage. People were writing us, well, I, the, the, the club was asking us to come, and I paid almost half a week of wages to go watch the, the team play. It's like, that's a bit of a fucking disgrace. The the wages, the, the tickets should have been refunded. That's my opinion. Um. But onward and upward, honestly, let's get past this period. Let's bring in a new technical director, a sporting director. Mistakes have been made. It was a moment of crisis. You don't always do things perfect. Um, and yeah, let, let's, let's try and fix it. A lot of comments are saying, why don't we have a winger? It's August 7th. Olympiacos has needed three or four wingers for all summer. It's like, are you fucking kidding me? We're sitting here in the same spot as we were last summer with 
shit like usual. We're That's worse the bigger off. problem. Worse We're off. Worse. We don't have shit. We don't have shit, guys. It's really bad. It's really I always bad. think, you know, really that really there's a big conversation that started like this week about Radjelovic, and some people are saying he's going to start on Thursday. I swear, I, I can't remember if I said it or not, but he's the only out and out winger that we have essentially that's fit. And that was going into the games against Maccabi and going into the return leg at home. I was thinking, like, plays in Kanago at the 10, finally. Put in, if that means, oh, no, because I don't have wingers, play Radjelovic. Play Radjelovic and put Masuras on the left. Yeah. Um, just side note, but that was under Martins and that was never going to happen. Um, are we transitioning to transfers now? Probably, yeah. yes. Um, I just want to bring this comment up because I thought it was quite interesting. Uh, Legend7 says, maybe we should organize an international show with Olympiago supporters from all around the world. Maybe an annual event. I mean, partly this show is already, like, I mean, I'm in Belgium. Uh, Labros was in Switzerland. He's in Belgium now as well. Ari's in the States. But it would be really cool because I know that we have, for a fact, people listening right now from Sweden, from Poland, from Greece, obviously, yeah. from Ireland. It would be really fucking cool if we if we could have I, I can't remember how many people we can get up on StreamYard. i think it's 10 max if we can get one person like from each country and we could do like a like an international thing that's a really nice idea it's something we'll we'll try and do send us send us direct messages guys from on instagram so that we can get connected there as well um and uh, see let's make that happen that's a really nice idea thank you yeah we do and we do respond we're actually I feel like we're really good about it, to be honest. Yeah, we get back to pretty much everybody. But uh, I actually, I, I kind of do like, like I was just thinking about what it would be like if we did actually have a physical spot we went to, somewhere in Europe even. And we actually, <laughs> if we could get like a few hundred, that would be really cool, wouldn't it? We actually it would get, be a game. Like, we would have to go to a game. It'd have it to be a game. Be. Yeah, 100%. But that would be real. Oh, man. I, I just got lost in thought for like 30 seconds thinking about that. It was, <laughs> and I don't know, that'd be... We, we should dream. i don't know if we can tell it but adi may be in the stadium in two weeks hopefully with me and a few friends so we may be in the stadium all together maybe watching we'll see. We'll see game. Game. So Impromptu fingers crossed blog. we'll try to make it we can't make promises yet it's still in the uh still in the uh cards Planning but phase. maybe we'll have a meet up and be at the stadium for the home opener please Apple, do not fuck us. That's like the oh, biggest God. thing. I, I will cry. You know what man. I mean? The stars yeah. aligning maybe for this and that. Uh... Yeah. <laughs> well, it's not even. Oh, lovely comment here from Yorgos Mustakas. Hey, guys, found your channel three, four days ago, and I'm blown away. Constructive criticism, civilized conversations, annual awards, deep dives. Please keep talking about football. No Greek toxic Epo talk. Hey, that's what we're that's what we're here for, man. It doesn't. It's not always civilized. Sometimes Just as I made the Epo, as I made the <laughs> Epo comment, I don't know what's going on. I don't know who delays the fixtures and everything. So I just really hope it doesn't happen again this year. Everyone has a TV deal, and we can just start the league on time because already the Premier League started, and we don't start for another two weeks. It's kind of incredible. But yeah, that's we'll see. usually we'll see. how it goes, isn't it? Uh, yeah. There's actually a comment I saw from George Gadilis I wanted to address really quick. Um, Costa, you actually kind of touched on this a little bit um, before. Uh, guys, how do you explain Marinaki's spending for Nottingham and the lack of it, at least with Libyakos? It's unacceptable. I know it's the Greek League, but it's doable. He has the money. I'm going to take a, a different approach to this because we've been seeing a lot of questions like this, and this is something I do disagree with. Uh, and I want to point out, guys, first and foremost um, – because it is a lot of it is about money, and I I want to share with you guys some just some figures uh, from the Premier League versus the Greek League, right? So we all know that Olympiakos just signed a deal, fifty five million euros over three years with Cosmonte, right? That's our that's our TV rights deal. So I'm going to share with you from the Premier League last season, the last place team, Norwich, relegated, what they got paid. And this isn't even ex including their sponsorship stadium revenue or anything. This is just what they got from their league position with merit payments and, and facility facility payments and, and the other commercial revenue. 
related to the league. Okay. 98.6 million British pounds. The last place team. And don't forget, for the next three seasons, they will get parachute payments. Assuming they don't get back into the top flight. They will get parachute payments to help them with their wages. So that is more money than Olympiacos will see, excluding Champions League, of course. That's more money than we will see at the rate that Cosmote is paying us now in six years. And that's one season if you come in last place in the Premier League. Doesn't matter. And that is going to increase this season. So the reason you see Marinaki is spending so much more money for Tottenham, or Tottenham, for uh, Nottingham, God, it's because he is going to be making a guaranteed 100 million pounds, not including gate receipts from the stadium or sponsorship deals he's doing. This is just league money. And like I said, this year, it's going to be higher. The last place team I, I saw somewhere could be making 110 million, 110 million British pounds. But with revenue. Also, also, the the big thing is they kind of need it. All of their, I don't think they were expecting to go up last season because mm-hmm. all of their best players were low knees. And still, you watched, I don't know if you guys saw the game with Nottingham Forest against Newcastle. They looked like easily easily the worst team in the division terrible just like horrific and they've spent huge money all summer bringing players in making a squad they looked so out of their depth um and so good luck to them they probably need a bunch new signings they um of course it's their first game together it's a whole new squad basically but don't forget is, newcastle we're pushing for a top seven spot this year though That's yeah but to. also they had players who looked like they could not even play in like the Greek Super League, to be honest. Like no, it, some of the it, midfielders, like Jack Colback, are you fucking kidding me? Like it's just shocking. And the fullback they had, the left wing back, Toffolo. Oh my goodness. Oh my god. Oleg was bad. I was watching Nottingham Forest and I was thinking, I've n- I was so uh, for a Premier League team, I've n- I haven't thought in a while in the current state that Olympiacos is in Mari Camara. Kunde, Jan and Via walk into their midfield. So, yeah, no, they're going to need a you. lot of freaking help to stay up this season because, yeah, Jesus You're Christ, right. like it's going to be difficult. It's going to be a long year. Some of even these, um, a lot of these low level, like English teams, Fulham, who just came up, look freaking good. Marco Silva had them playing fantastic. So, yeah, yeah, this listen. was also funny. The corner routine. Did you see this? No one was in the box, and then they yeah. kicked it in, and they ran in the box, and the goalkeeper just like had no one on him. He just like collected the ball and was like looking around. He was like, "Is, <laughs> is this a joke? Was this a joke?" Yes. Yeah, so. It was their only listen. corner of the game too, so it was quite funny. But listen, you're you you're making my point for me, and that and this is yeah. the whole they thing. They need and the I money. Go... They need to spend on players because their whole team from last season was gone. They were loaning. But I want to go oh. one step further, right? Because that was just the context for what my opinion is. And my opinion is, what we do see from Marinakis tells me that he loves this club. We've already told you guys in the past. He doesn't own Libiacos because he's making money from Libiacos. He doesn't own Libiacos for the money. He is an Libiacos fan. At heart, he sunk 10 million euros already share capital increase because we were in the red. For those of you that aren't financially savvy, being in the red means we lost money. And you can only do a share capital increase under the current financial fair play. Well, it's not financial fair play, whatever, whatever they call it now. You can only do a share capital increase to cover your losses to a certain extent. Because a Once you get a certain amount of losses, you can have those losses, but then anything beyond what's allowable for your club and your budget sheet, you you can put equity in or dump money in basically to to cover those losses. So that's what he did, which means our losses exceeded a certain amount already. Now, a person that only cares about the money would not have done that. He he loves this club, and that's why he did it. And he's going to have to do it again, by the way, because – our our payroll is a nightmare. So this this is just this is just the the reality of it. Okay, I understand that you guys want to see him spending a hundred million for Libyakos. I'd love to see that too. 
but we can't until until the Greek league and until more money comes into Greece for football. That's never going to happen. And the amount of money that he does put in, it it's because he loves this club. So I just wanted to make sure that that was clear because there's this there there. Unfortunately, guys, this is the way it is. The most money goes to the Premier League. That's just it. That is the most well-funded league in the world. Better than any other league. The most money goes there. And that's why he can spend more. Because he's guaranteed to get 10 times what he can make in Greece. Yeah, but also he's paying so much money for the wage budget of Olympiacos. Sometimes I think of myself, yeah. what if I'm the owner of Olympiacos and I had Francois Modesto signing players and giving Kunde one and a half million euros a season. Now Fortunis, not even a start, two million euros sitting on the the bench. Ruben Semedo for years making big salary, wasn't even in the team. Lovera, right. I paid five million, four million euros for, and he doesn't even in the, sit in the team. Soldano, I signed, doesn't even get in the team. I I gave you Usainu Ba, he's not in the team. How much money? I gave him a contract extension. I see Manolas, he can barely play two games in a row. Um. I would be so livid. I'm paying like imagine every week you write the the check and you look and you're like, Kunde, I'm writing the fucking check. Are you kidding me? Pepe, I'm writing the check. Maxi Lovera, I'm writing a check. And and you you just go down the list and you're like, what am I paying you for? Like, what are you doing here? Like you have we've talked about this so many times on the show, and there's a lot of new people here the past few nights, but there's so many useless pieces of dead weight at Olympiacos that take up millions of euros not just a year like probably a million two million euros a month they're paying <laughs> like in just shit salary like to be honest with you so if I was the owner that's the the the, the light I have I hired someone who's known in football has connections and he brought me like Henry Onyakuru and I paid five, six million euros for Henry Onikuru on a massive contract. And I'm just like, and then everyone's <laughs> like, you don't spend money. And I'm just like, well, I just spent fucking six million euros, five million euros on fucking Henry Onikuru and I'm paying his salary. Like, you know what I mean? And I get zero from Greek football. Like, you, you know how much money like winning the Greek Super League is? Like, basically a drop in the water. So I will say that. And we haven't played Champions League in two years two now, years. so the money is not really flowing into the the pockets right now there's no big sales happening in the past two years so. speaking of sales but well, it's not actually a sale is it pepe is apparently going to turkey there were rules there was all this talk about him going to spain or there were bids from cadiz or getafe or some some of the teams in la liga that are towards the bottom end of the table but that's not happening it looks like he's going to anakuru kuchu in turkey that's going to be a loan with option that will probably not get triggered and then he'll be back again next season and we'll be thinking about what to do with him um so yeah pepe pepe's going out on loan Samedo's out the door and then otherwise we've still got a boatload of players that are sitting there like you said Fortunis, Brusai, we get questions every single live we do about Fortunis, the creativity problem. How does that just, there's a comment here about how does that justify not using him? We've talked about this so many times before, guys. Uh, I, None of us see a way back for Fortunis. I think this is more than Martin's decision. It's a board decision. A lot of things have happened uh, on both sides, from the player side, from the team side. He's getting paid 1.7 million euro this year. Um, I don't think he wants to move away from Greece. I think that's the problem too. Because he just had a kid. His wife's a teacher, teaches at school. I don't think they want to move. So what's his option? He wants going to go and play for another Greek club. Who's he going to play for? Balk, Aris, Ayek. Yeah, so that's a, that's a real issue that they have on their hands with, with Fortunis. And I think, uh, I think the way it's gone now, you can almost call it, bad blood like does he really want to be there now so let's see let's let's hope for the for the best for the best outcome there but i just can't see a way back for him into this team i uh, i'm with you man I, I don't either as much as it pains me to say that because i i i love players like like fortuni i mean uh yanakopoulos when we interviewed stelio 
God, it's been almost two years now since we interviewed him. Um, he brought up that uh, uh, Costa reminded him of Carapialis. Yeah. And I, uh, I love players like that with a little bit of flair. And I feel like we've always had at Olympiacos, at least since I've been watching, I feel like we've always had a player that had something like that. We always had a difference maker, whether it was a guy like Fortunis or a guy like uh, Carapialis or a guy like Podense, you know what I mean? Or, uh, uh, or Tori Dominguez, you know what I mean? We always had, we've always had difference makers on this team. But this Greek is Greek player, season. Greek Say player too. Greek and, and player, Greek player too. Yeah. yeah. And this is the first year that I don't, there's nobody I, I look at on this team right now and see this guy's a difference maker. You know what I mean? Like this mm -hmm. is a guy that I really enjoy watching day in, day out. There were some players that I thought could come close to that, but none. There's no player that's like this guy. I see this guy as, uh, you know, somebody that can do – anytime you're, he's on the field, I feel like something's going to happen. And and maybe the Beznikazi era, I guess, sort of. Yeah. Also, <laughs> Beznikazi team played better football than this team. Is Maybe that like the latter stages? Mm, I don't, they like literally went to Partizan and threw them down, and then passed Rijeka. Yeah, but, and yeah, but they had they, they, they did no fitness training. They did no fitness training that year. They were just like, all right, let's get ready for these games, and then who gives a shit about fitness? So they yeah, were playing okay. against them, and they were just like, okay, okay, anyway. fitness doesn't matter, baby. Results. That's. <laughs> <laughs> uh, like, and then yeah, then we saw how that season went. Yeah, then we yeah. saw how that went. What was it like? Three on. What, what, remember, like the the announcer Pardo scored that goal at the end of the sporting game. What was that? Three two. I was at that game. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, fuck, yeah. that was a shit game. But um, what I want to say, yeah, fuck. What is there's no point of talking for so I know, like everyone wants to. Like we get questions every single time we 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 do it, it's over basically. I just don't want to talk about it anymore. Um, whatever. He's, a, gener want, he's every, a generational player, and it's and it's it's done. It's disappointing. It, was, it was the same before Fefatzidis left the first time. It was the same conversations with Fefatzidis back then. We had we had this kid that was like, oh, hey, small center of gravity. Of course, everybody called him the Greek Messi. And it was it was he was Greek and and that's the thing like he's Greek and it's a player that it's exciting and can do these very interesting things, and and you want it to work. That's the thing, man. You want it to you want it to work out, yeah, because of those things, and then it doesn't. So un I mean, unfortunately, if we're being if we're being objective, it's just it's not. And yet, and that was the same thing with Fefatsidis. He never really did it for Olympiacos. Injuries, whatever it was, disappearing in games half the time. And it, it, it in the even though they're Greek, they are players in the end. So I mean, yeah, it, we've lived it really so many good hurts. moments with Fortunis, yeah. though. Like we have, we really like have. we've lived impeccable moments. Uh, just think about that Marco Silva season, the Milan game in of itself at home when he took the game on the back. Some of those, uh, you, you you know, like some of those derby games with Ike, some of those. Uh, just, I love this. Some of your, some of my favorite memories throughout the year have been some memorable Costas Fortunis games, um, yeah. and it's difficult. It's like, it's like the end of a period, at end of a relationship almost, and um, yeah, and really, it, it it just needs to to end almost because it's over, um, and that that's it. You know, that's really it. Yeah, so. I don't know. I don't really have much to say. Alfred Finboga. This is an interesting, is interesting comment. What, what, what is breaking that? Alfred Finbogas on his back? Yes or no? It's like, would we take him? Oh, mate, in a heartbeat, I'd snap that up. Probably. I. What did? What does he even do now? Where does he play? Was he playing? I think he's playing a. Wow. He's playing at Augsburg, I think. Oh, I don't know if he's okay. moved. Still Honestly, do we goals, need like sure. another immobile striker? Is that like he's not? An, he's not an immobile striker. I don't know okay, what. He's not exactly watching. like fucking he's more mobile than any striker that we have. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I was about um, to say. But um. Anyway, I hear. I, I I saw. I read somewhere like this isn't like a 
strong report that Tiquinho's leaving next week after the Bratislava game. But yeah, that makes so no sense because he's been our starting striker all season. This is, <laughs> makes no sense. Um, yeah. But also on transfer front, it's been so, so quiet. Like, other than what? what is the guy? I, I put him on the thumbnail. What's his name? Cabral? Jovan. Jovan Cabral, yeah. Cabral. He's like the first name I've heard in weeks, like since Martins has been canned, which makes sense. New coach comes in. Okay. But. Jesus well, Christ, is there Bardi. no one else on the list? Like, what, what's Bardi, going on? Right? From Who? Levante? Bardi, right? Yeah. He's more of a. He's like he's a more cam. of a, like, an eight. He's like an eight, ten, like Thiago Alcantara yeah. type player. Yeah. Yeah. But so, that's, gone, that's, that's gone quiet, too. So, yeah, so technical... now we're. Go ahead. Yeah. So now we're looking like who were the wingers coming in? Personally, I would do with Enkudu. <laughs> <laughs> is that his name what, what was his name again was it Nkuku? Pierre, Pierre Nkuku. no Enkuku was the wrong one I remember Enkuku was the wrong one Enkuku was the wrong Enkudu yes Enku, Enkuku Enkudu yeah. oh, for fuck's sake <laughs> I'm sorry I hope he doesn't sign just because of the name actually not just because of the name probably because he's also shit so we, he was linked with us last summer wasn't he yeah i remember he's linked with us every oh, summer every summer. With us. i remember because i remember looking into like doing like some brief film watching last summer and i remember like do not i please don't sign this player i remember not literally him. people are like oh he came from the tottenham academy let's sign in kudu it's like are you fucking serious i'm gonna anyway so really the winger we want who knows? I uh, let's just what, wait and see. But but we, okay, this is the thing though. Let's wait and see. It's August seventh. Like what's let's wait and see? Like the league starts in three weeks, and we never replaced Onyekuru. We never replaced Ronnie Lopez, and now we're sitting here and we're like, we have no wingers. Is Marco Marin available for on a free transfer what, or something? Like he what the hell are we? Ah shit. Yeah, I'll just say. Okay, well that's not good. That's one we're of gonna... our options out the window. Is Hatem Ben Arfa available? Is <laughs> Sam Nazari still available? I don't perennial, know. Perennial I'm targets. desperate here, guys. Like I'm I'm <laughs> I'm getting desperate for a new winger. We're gonna we've already said what we know. Ricardo about Quaresma, you think he's still got it? <laughs> oh yeah. Can you do the oh, D5? Yeah. I think he's like 38, but fuck it. One last dance. <laughs> One last dance. <laughs> what 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 we do know. What we do know, because it's true, there hasn't been any any new names that have come out. It's normal. I mean, we hired a manager yeah. less than a week ago, so he has to. I mean, he, he has looked at the names on the squad list and who's there. He's done his preliminary analysis. He's had a game now. He's seen the team one match. So yeah. the reports that are out there, they suggest we you know, first things first. Priority is a winger. I don't know why Labros is laughing. I'm um, laughing because I'm thinking of the Nico Scotsis article where he's like, oh, they're looking for a left-footed winger. And someone yeah. tweeted at him, Olympiakos is looking for a winger with two feet. Two legs. <laughs> 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 yeah. so we can't That's even true. find one with two feet, you know? Like, yeah. What do you mean left yeah. footed? Where, anyway. Yeah, was, just, yeah that, was, that, that was funny. That was the first thing I saw this morning when I was... <laughs> yeah. It's waking crazy. up i thought oh that's hilarious it took me a moment because i just woken up so like, oh does he mean he's looking for a two-footed player or does it really like, literally mean looking for a winger with two legs right now but anyway um yeah look we can go we're gonna go nuts we're gonna drive ourselves nuts talking about what ifs what we could be looking for we know what we know that's it i think we should move on to briefly dis discussing the bratislava game with this question right here i like this from george gadilis Score predictions in Bratislava. The team better not play only 20 minutes, then ease off. I want full press for the full 90 because this game is crucial for our European journey this year. Well, I can tell you there's no full 90 press happening. That's for sure. Yeah. Full 90 press. It's not happening, man. We don't know. No. <laughs> did, did you guys see? I People are so mixed on Kunde. You know, there there's a, very few players when, like, 40, 50% are like, oh, he played really good. And then the other 50% is like, what does this guy do? He's complete shit. Kunde made a lung bursting run. I don't know if you guys saw this. Like he was pressing. He was running. I don't remember at what point. I think it was in the second half. He was just running so hard. He like did a fantastic press. 
and um, they just played him right behind, like right, right by him. And he turned around and no one was pressing behind him. And he was like, oh, shit. And he literally walked all the way back to the defensive line because he was so dead tired. Um, yeah. Well, says, he has, a lot he has an important role. I don't know if you guys noticed that. And maybe we can get into that now uh, since we're sort of talking. Oh, yes. Gunny Ball, Ari, I'm glad, buddy. Ari, is that the shirt? I'm trying to. I'm trying to I'll, uh, I'll stand up so you can see it in all its glory. Bravo. I'm trying to remember. That's the season with Dio- we had Diogo? Yes. That was oh, the that, uh, yeah. the 2009-2010, the, that season. This was the kit. Or was it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nine, ten, nine, ten, nine, ten. That's the I last. I really hope the third kit looks like the last red. time we saw black. This black, kit slaps. Yeah. Okay, and I'm sick of the blue jerseys. I wore this because I want everybody to remember how sexy these black kits mm-hmm. were. Okay, They're so the, good. You yeah. know what? I want the gold one too. Do you guys remember the gold kit? I the Lambert, Rivaldo I don't know if you one. Remember. Mm-hmm. Yes, the one I, I want that gold kit back. Very. Yeah. I heard the uh, third kit's going to be a silver one. By the way. Oh, I, I don't mind silver. Don't oh, mind silver. Man, it depends sil- how it looks. Though. It's the same every year. Silver, blue, whatever. Blue. I'm well, done. Last with season, blue. what was it called? They called back. it like wolf. They're like the wolf kit. It's like it's just fucking silver. This, this it's like this jersey. You know what I mean? I I don't do blue. Olympiacos is not blue. Olympiacos is red and white. I'll accept black, but uh, red and white. That's that's it. I don't do this blue crap anymore. Okay. Um. Uh, anyway, where were we? Oh yeah, that's right. We were talking about. Kunde and how important he is for the formation. So, so yeah, there Adi, some... you weren't on the pod last week. What, like, tell us about Kunde, but also tell us what you thought of Carlos Copa. So, so uh, there were people that messaged me, and everyone, a lot of people asked me, where are the triangles? <laughs> so, <laughs> I, ad, admittedly, admittedly, you didn't see a lot of it. Well, because the movement was a little disjointed. You had players. I can't tell you how many times we saw players like start to make a run, like go forward, but then they stopped and went back almost like they were like, oh, shoot, I'm supposed to come back here. That's going to take time. We did see some. We did, we did see some triangles here and there. It wasn't very often or as often as we saw at Huddersfield. But remember, at the press conference, when we when we asked him the question, he had said like it took time to build those shapes. So he's yeah. just focusing right now on a shape, getting something together that's consistent. So in the defensive side of things, we actually didn't see that 4141 that I talked about at Huddersfield. What we saw was 433 pretty much the whole way up. So uh I have a little chart here guys uh that I made for you so you can see a couple instances of the the defensive shape in in play so we this is what we saw all game anytime anytime slovan had the ball in their half of the field this is how we lined up like this look you have um all, you have your your front three sitting there uh just as they are i really i forgot that i don't have like my pointer here you guys can't see it but anyway you have your front three your midfield three and your back four now there's a huge difference here because look at how spread out we are and this makes so much sense. New coach, the shape is important, and he wants to cover space. So it looks a little bit different than what we saw at Huddersfield. And then even when they were deeper in our half, we would see a shape like this. Again, it's still the 4-3-3. It's just slightly more compact. He's just getting to know these players. He's just sticking with a shape and st- and just to, just to get everybody on the same page. We may see a slight variation com- come match day this week. But I think we're just going to see more of the same in this 4-3-3. Now, going back to the original question is, which is why is Kunde so important in this 4-3-3 um, formation? And what I'll do is I will quickly share for you guys my screen so that you can see what I'm talking about. Another, you guys loved the little tactics board last time, so I'm just including it for a little, uh, a little quick uh, coaching go. session for everybody. Give me one second. And, and also, can, can you, you guys talk see about my screen? the shit show that was Madi Kamara last and like? Well, we'll get into or... that. But okay. here's your shape, right? Here's your four-three-three. Now we're talking off the ball here. 
So you had your front three. And as I mentioned, the idea was to keep everything spaced. So everybody kind of was in a uniform space. When they got into when they got into our half, everybody would condense. You would see like this. You get into our half, everybody condenses, stays tight, but the shape remains the same. What was what was going on here was during the press. Remember that guy I told you about? How sometimes instead of this the center forward making the press for people, it was the it was the midfielder. Yeah. Who do you think was the guy making the the run to press the ball? Yeah, Most I, of the time. I, I noted that with Costa when we were watching the game. It was Kunde was up. It there. was Kunde. Who do you think the guy was that was running to press the ball while the midfielders were gathering behind him? It was Kunde. Kunde is the guy in this in this four three three setup that is doing the running. And now remember, so this is Kunde, right? This is Jan and Vila. Jan was sitting here a lot of the game in front of the defense. As we talked about, he's the pivot. So when it comes to being the bridge between the midfield and the defense, it's Jan. Jan's going to sit here. So when the fullbacks come forward, Jan is here in the back three. He's going to come forward here. The center backs are going to split apart like this. And we have this overload stack in the midfield, just like this. Jan controlling the ball, moving it in and around. We saw that coming. And he had almost 80 touches. 80, 85 touches that game. So that's going to be a strategy going forward. But off the ball, Kunde is here. And Madi was supposed to be covering around where Kunde was going. But Kunde was all over the place, everywhere, covering all of this ground, regardless of what these guys were doing. So for anybody that was confused about his role, Kunde was a dog up and down. And this is one thing where. I'm not going to accept any of the disrespect people had for him because he was all over the place, all game, and that was his role. Without Kunde, this game would have turned really bad. You guys saw it early on in the game, right? There were a couple of, um, what was it, the first 15 minutes, there were a couple of uh, opportunities that they had against us, right, including the goal mm -hmm. that they scored against us. Okay, the formation wasn't... Um, uh, the formation wasn't maybe set. The players weren't super into it. But as things wore on in the game, it did get a little bit more settled. And the midfield stability that we did have was because of Kunde. Now, again, moving forward, I don't believe that the 4-3-3 is what we will stick with. I, I think he's going to want to get back to where he did, where he got with Huddersfield. 3-4-3, 4-3-3 in transitions, 4-1-4-1, depending um, but right now we have only a couple of constants for the, for the system as it stands. One, we have a distributor that a pivot, we, the, the pivot, we should say Jan and Vila. That's the constant. We already told you guys the pivot has an important job with this club. The only question would be, do we want somebody that covers ground up and down? Or do we want somebody that's a distributor? Because we don't have both unless we use Huang which, well, he wasn't eligible. Seeing Jan and Vila in that role, I know some people were giving him crap. I thought he was great. 92% pass accuracy, guys. This man, this man attempted almost 80 passes that game. You guys saw the stats. Go stop, put them up. Our beautiful stat cards. A lot of you maybe haven't touched a ball on the field, but do you know how hard it is when you are passing the ball almost 80 times to hit feet 80 times, 92, I don't think many of you actually understand how difficult that is. Yanavila was on his game, and so was Kunde, covering ground. Without those two, this game would have turned really bad for us. And these are the two constants. We have Yanavila in the pivot and Kunde as the dog. Those are the constants, and those are what we're going to see. We'll see this shape evolve, but I don't think much is going to change outside of that for this game coming up. So um, I have a question for you Go ahead of the, in the next game. But before that, just when Labra and I were watching the game, definitely we saw a lot of the things that you were telling us about when you'd done the analysis. The first thing that I think we, we all noticed was Jan and Villar got a lot of touches on the ball. Was it 72 out of 78 passes completed? Yeah. A lot of touches. Um, great to see, particularly in the first half. And he was dropping back 
forming a three and the wing backs were going up and it, it looked almost like a three four three like what you showed us on the on the on the graph or or if not a three five two because Masuras was playing very close to very close yeah. to Tiquinho, like off the shoulder looking for the flick on it was either Masuras or Zinconago. So we already started to see those things. I think that's that's very positive. What I want to ask you is going into the game on Thursday, there's a lot of talk now about us playing with a 10. So that means a 4-2-3-1. You talked about Envila as the pivot and Kunde as the runner in midfield, the one that's pressing pressing the opposition more with more intent. We haven't played with a 10 for a while, never this season so far. And the my my analysis is that Martins didn't want to play with a 10 because he feared that we were weak on the defensive transition when we didn't have bodies in midfield. So that means that the 10 has to press with the team very well. Um, it means we may well be exposed to those defensive frailties and weaknesses that we have on the defensive transition. Do you think we're going to be able to do that on Thursday? Do you think it's a good idea to go into Thursday's game with MV Lion Kunde in midfield and Zinc and Argo at the 10? That is a really good question. That's a, that's a, a great question. The Here's my thing. Um, so the way Corbaran, well, again, a lot of this is based on what he, I saw at Huddersfield. So the way he plays, I he doesn't use a traditional 10, or at least he doesn't use a 10 in a traditional manner, or what we think, what we are used to as traditional, right? Uh, a modern 10, or what is considered the modern 10, modern creative player, is usually further out on the wing, some type of inside winger. That's usually where a lot of playmakers are in the modern game. I saw Corberon use the 4-2-3-1 early on at his time at Huddersfield, and it wasn't pretty or at least the times I saw it. Maybe it's because the 10 he used wasn't that good. I mean, then again, the player wasn't that impressive to me. They don't have so the players. Right. That is that is part of it. But also, when he played in the 4-2-3-1, it did not look like a traditional double pivot. If you guys remember what we saw with, uh, with Martins, right, or at most Portuguese coaches, we've run with a double pivot. So actually, I'll share my screen so I can visualize this for you guys again. Uh, give me one second. And we'll go back and see so I can show you guys what I mean when I talk about double pivot. So let's uh, here. Let me fix my chart real here real quick here. Right. So we've, we're going to have our uh, four. Bring you down. All right. So with Martins, we had our for the most part, we had our four, two, three, one. Right. Here's your attacking mid with your wingers here. And then usually your attackers up front here. Right. So generally, when you have a 4-2-3-1 like this, it's called a double pivot because these two midfielders, um, usually one of them is more box-to-box, -box, more creative, uh, deep-lying playmaker. Uh, it can be one of those. or And the other one, this is your ball winner, right? So one is your ball winner, uh, usually a guy that can pick the ball out, usually get it to the more creative player, uh, and the person that's usually running around to win the ball. And then this guy can either be a box-to-box -box guy, Madi, is uh, a guy I love to have in this role uh, when he's at his prime. Or it can be somebody that's a little bit deeper playmaker like Yana Vila. Your 10 here is your prime creator in the offense. Your Cosas Fortunis, your uh, your Carvalho, or as we've heard Tassos some people... Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Don't, don't do that to me right now. <laughs> anyway, uh, your Zincarnargo, how, how some people say... Yeah. Um, so that's, that's usually how it shapes. So in transition and, and as things are going forward, usually you want your 10 to be in between the midfield and defensive line, uh, creating chaos so that when he gets the ball, he's able to distribute to your wingers. Ideally, you want one of these guys to be wide, maybe one be inside. Traditionally, they're both wide to make space. Uh, and then your, your ball winners here while this guy's anticipating or covering the spaces. When Corbaron played this, We'll put these back. When Corbaron played the system, 
This didn't act as a double pivot. It wasn't, I didn't see two midfielders playing off with each other, one more defensive oriented and one that was more the playmaker. I saw two guys whose job was to get forward. I would see a lot of this uh, at Huddersfield. So you'd have the attacking midfielder sometimes playing the ball. You'd have a winger making a run here. The defensive midfielder, or I should say the deeper center midfield coming here. Ideally, this guy's supposed to be here covering the space, right? Nope, not the case. This guy was getting forward with the winger. Then the attacking midfielder is the one dropping deeper. At that point, what's the point of the double pivot? That's what I saw when he ran the 4-2-3-1 versus what you would have seen with Pedro Martins is you would have here. Let me set this back up. So you have your attacking mid, your wings coming back, and then your double pivot. What we would see with Pedro Martins was, okay, transition's happening. Winger's coming forward. Your midfielder, your more creative one, is waiting here to receive the ball to distribute for your attacking mid, the runner here. And this guy is covering space to be an outlet and also to watch for a counter. This is why a lot of our offensive shapes were so lopsided because we were so conservative with Pedro Martins. Even with an, uh, an overlapping fullback here and here, we had so many bodies back that we would end up with this lopsided shape, if you guys remember, where we would have everybody lining up in a line here, and then you would have two guys with the ball like this. That was Martin's lopsided shape. We didn't see that with Corberon. With Corberon, it was like you had one guy and then everybody up here moving around doing whatever. So I don't think if well i'll say this if we do see a 4231 under on it's not going to look like it did under martins you're not going to see the traditional double pivot it's going to be a little bit different uh it's probably still going to be more like a 433 instead of a, a you know the 4231 that we saw before so mm. if we play with a 10 i i still Maybe, maybe the shape initially starts out with, let's say it's Zinkarnago, right? Maybe he starts in that middle slot, but I just don't see how he doesn't end up out on the wing again. The shape isn't going to be like what we're used to, if, if that answers your question. Mm. I guess so, we'll have to. We're, we're, I mean, we're going we'll to see on see. Thursday. They we'll already say if... that Al Arabi is going to start and Vlangelovic. He has to. But it's like, who does Rangelovic come in for? Um, is he coming in for Zinkernagel or is he coming in for Marikamara? I think that's the... Well, that's it. He has to drop a midfielder to he is. Yeah. play a 10. So, um, Marikamara so, can't can't stay. Like, it was he, a disaster this this past week. It was really Here bad. is it's funny what... Oh, go it's ahead, funny. Go ahead. So, sorry, it's funny because his body language at the beginning of the game was quite interesting. If you you watch the pre-game, he was like talking to to the teammates and he was like giving instructions and stuff. And just like, okay, that's interesting. And then in the game, it was just more of the same. Like he had a decent preseason. We were talking about compared to what we'd seen last season, which was very bad, like poor for the standards we're used to. And then just nothing. And um, th this question's come up a few times in the comments. I'm going to bring it up. Agibu Kamara, is he done? Mismanaged. Just a mismanaged yes. player that, that that he thought, I mean, Martins basically made him irreplaceable last season. This is a kid that's never played more than a couple of games of professional football. And he's been thrust into the limelight. All sorts of transfer stories. Liverpool want him, blah, blah, blah. Maybe it all got to his head. And then a lot of players came back from Copa Africa and they weren't the same. I mean, look at uh, I mean, Mo Salah at Liverpool. He wasn't the same. One example. But I think it's good for him to sit on the bench for a little bit, put things into perspective. But I'm I'm sure we'll see him back at some point. He didn't even think... warm up. He didn't warm up. I remember when they were making changes. Um, yeah. You know how they're like, oh, blah, 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 is warming up. Uh, Ayubu never even got off the bench. Yeah. Look, I'm going to say, even even if we take into account the, the good times we have with Agibu, I don't see him as a player that fits the system too well. Uh, we talked about it before. Agibu as a player was better. Like, we saw his best moments for us in two areas of context. On the counter and off, off of set pieces when he would take these wonder shots on the periphery of the penalty box. That was when we saw the best out of him. 
I don't see him playing in this type of system very well. Maybe, maybe if you use him deeper uh, in like a similar role to Kunde, maybe, and he can be a ball winner because he he can get the ball forward. He can win the ball and then make something from there. You guys remember Fenerbahce. You remember some games that we had where he would win the ball when we were doing the mid block and he was the start of some of these great runs forward. In a system like what we believe Corberon is trying to implement here, I don't see a place for him because even we're seeing, I think more because he's just starting here, a sort of defense first approach until things get normalized, but I don't think it's going to stay that way. I don't think Libyakos fans would accept a defense first approach. And that's the only way I see Agibu having any sort of relevance here. Relevance. If I think I said relevance, but anyway, that's, that's my, that's my opinion. I mean, in his press in his press conferences, he's talked a lot about working on things offensively. Because he's, yeah. I mean, you don't need to be a football coach to diagnose that we have a creativity problem. But exactly. th those those are the things that I've picked up on a lot in what he's been saying in the public about uh, focusing a lot on on offense, movement, but also the key word is balance. So it goes back to what I said earlier about okay, if you play that four two three one in in Slovakia, even against the half decent side, it's not like a world beating side that we're going to go and play against, God forbid. So uh, that's, th that is the key word, balance. It's having balance in the team. Yep. Um, something he said in his first press conference as well. I think it was part of the answer to the question that we gave. It's like he uses different shapes, but bottom line right now is we need a base, like we need a foundation, we need to be solid. And let's hope we start to see some of those aftermatismos. I can't think of the word in English right now. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. And I, look, it, me personally, I don't want to see him like over tinkering a lot in the beginning. If it's because he sees something in training and maybe he's like, look, I need to keep the guys with what they know before I mix things up too much. Okay, I understand that. But I think we're on the right track. Look, one game. And we saw and we saw some notable differences. I, I have the stats pulled up compared to what happened at Haifa over two legs versus what happened at Slovan. And it's all positive. It's all positive. Well, this is a nice comment actually from Nolan Lidner Fox that I think we should address. I think Agibu has something like the most interceptions in Europa League last season. Yeah, yeah. No, he he was up there. Um and this, this comment from Muscarius is also correct. I think Agibu got burned out due to the unstoppable games. Thanks to Martins. Just like, oh, like these are guys, these are all true, true pieces of this equation. Right. But even, even the underlying parts of that, right. If we look at context, when how so many people succeeded and didn't succeed, we, we start to see patterns and similarity. And that's, that's the stuff that we're, addressing here in an offensive system. I still think Agibu is going to struggle if he is not the ball winner, at least in a deeper setting. And we haven't seen him really do that that often, but going back to the, to the comparisons between what we did against Haifa versus Slovan, everything in this first game against Slovan was better. Everything was better. XG. If we average it per 90 was 40% higher for us this time, number of passes, number of open play attacks, shots, forward passes everything act like our efficiency metrics were way better across the board so if i'm looking at this and i'm talking to the coach i'm telling him listen what you did the in a couple of days with the club with the guys all right you know what it was a one one but this is the right track i i don't want him to deviate so much when it seemed like it was functional after the, after the beginning of the game, at least, you know what I mean? Th that's how I look at it. When I see everything, the underlying, forget the score underlying in the score with var various, with various performance metrics was better. I want to stay the course because I think if we stick with that, we're likely to have success, but that's, mm. that's how I look at it. Honestly, I think you have to put in Golo Kante and I want to put up a graphic audio that I've been working on and this kind of explains it. <laughs> I, th well, well, I think well, well, you, well. you need to play yeah. i need to you need to play the small and golo kante in your most important matches um i worked on that graphic 
Um, sorry, I just had to. I it was there for the taking. <laughs> anyway, I I, I don't think. You can... He's not. Okay. Going up there. <laughs> Uh, I I deserve that. But anyway, I I think he's burned. I don't even think he's in the plan for next week. Also, um, should we say Jao Carvalho has been like binned off? You know, <laughs> he's been here for like six months. I was like, ah, oh, fuck off, mate. You're, <laughs> you know what I mean. So um, yeah. So that's another that's midfield. Another... Interested. That's another story. Who do we have? So we have Kunde. We have Mari Kamara. So who can play in those two roles? So Mari Kamara is tragic. So. Who else do we want? Obviously, we want Huang. We can't play Huang because the, this like Russian papers thing. I've never heard this in my life, but mm -hmm. okay. Um, even like... even if his papers even, even if his papers come tomorrow, he can't. Play. Yeah, now he's on the list. He's not listed. The, honestly, just to clarify, papers are we really waiting for papers from the Russian FA? Really, like that's not the that first really... time something like this has happened. No, but yeah. like. The Russians, are we like given the current situation where we're taking basically one of their players for free? Are we really expecting them to send the papers on time? They're fucking like, it's let's not be the real. club, it's not the club, it's not us, it's, it's not, not, the not club. Us. yeah. No, it's not, it's not the club on the other end either, it's the federation, and it's yeah, federation. exactly. Yeah. So, you, you, you expect like the Russian federation to be like helping their players leave for free. I doubt it, you know, given the current situation where they're banned from Europe, they're banned from everything. They see other clubs taking their players. So, like, well, maybe we'll slow that down a bit. No offense. That's what I think. But, okay, <laughs> what, what more can be said? So, who else do you have to play in that pressing role? My mind instantly goes to Andreas Buchalakis, but I just don't know. <laughs> Come on, Okay, man. sorry. I, I'm in a bit of a joking mood. It's something <laughs> I'm just... So, my mind then goes to... That's it, right? They're, they're, it's Kunde and Madi. That's it. There's nothing else, guys. There's nothing else. I mean, uh, you, you made the joke about, yeah, comparing Agibu Kamara to Nkolo Kante is ridiculous. But what was it? there was even a comparison to Nabi Keita, the Liverpool player, the Ghanaian. Oh, I mean, I, ca Kane. I, Kane. I can't see it happening with Agibu. I think it will yeah. be Mvila and Kunde. We don't have other players in the in the squad that can that can do that. Madi Kamara, forget about it. Like, I'm done. I'm done. I'm done with him. Like, let him go to Forest. Like, I swear, prediction. If he hasn't gone to, if he hasn't gone somewhere by the end of August, ship him off to Forest. Just do it. They need a midfielder like him. Gets in the Premier League, changes his mind, way of looking at things. Good for him. Like, just just get it done. I'd yeah exactly. I would just rather it be over with. You know what I mean. Also, um, get done. Throw yeah. Oleg into the deal as well. Oleg should be. Also, Oleg happening. is a bit of a Martin situation. Everyone's like, Oleg, fuck off, and then they're like, Oh wait, we don't have another left back. <laughs> Can you stay that, for a little longer? It's like it's like Pedro Martins is like, you bastard, resign, and then they're like. But please don't resign until Monday night because we need you to train the team. Please, God, don't leave. But you got to go. You know what I mean? They're like, Oleg, fuck you. You got to go. But then they're like, actually, Oleg, stay until the end of August because we can't sign a left back. We haven't been able to sign a left back in three years. Like, absolutely fantastic. The to just to defend Bukai like he's a little bit. I know everybody likes to shit on him all the time. No, he's finished. Uh, he's they, like a finished there's... player. He's a dead body. Like the dude needs to go. To I, think he's burnt. I think he's burnt. I think too, he's man. he's done. He's another one who's been destroyed by Pedro Martins. And he wasn't exactly Sergio Busquets before. So like led the team, led the team in through balls, smart passes, FYI. Per 90. Still putting that out there. Yeah. He is a he is a good distributor of the ball. He yeah, has he major confidence issues, but he's also the way the way the pivot's being used just in the first game that we saw. There's only one other player that can spray the ball around like that on this team in a deep lying position, and that is Bukai Likes. So if if you can't just f him off that fast, I mean we don't want to use Huang in that position. We need Huang further forward when he is yeah. available. But for the game, at least for Haifa, that's we need him as a rotation for Mvila. And yeah. during the season, unless we have somebody else to do it, 
he needs to be the sub for Mvila. Yeah. So you can't F him off that quickly because we don't have anybody else that can do that. We don't have anyone anywhere. That's the thing. You go through the roster, you're like, oh, the roster is quite good. And then you go player by player. You're like, uh, not ideal. Not great. One of the bright spots, like let's share everyone out. Uh, little Lavia played pretty well last week. He like dyed his hair black again. Played pretty good. Played pretty good. <laughs> I told you he, he just needed time. And look, and now he's got the guy yeah. that he played with. I Yeah, no, I was hoping he has Corberan now and he yeah. turns into like be with, under Martins, like it looked like it was about to be a, a disaster. So there's a question I saw about DB Kieta. Hold on, I have to find DB it. Keita. Um, there's a lot of good players from that little B team that went to some village to play a tournament. Like, why don't we call some of them over? I, I I have no I swear I saw this question in the comments and I can't oh here it is from Chris Sit. Guys, do you have any information about DB Kieta, uh left uh, fullback that we got? He's a left winger. He's left a left winger, winger fullback. Yeah. Yeah. Um but uh Dabo was the one that got injured. Yeah. He had DB uh, Kieta was at preseason. He was yeah. DB Kieta was in Austria. But Keita He's, was also uh, carrying an injury for like a season. It's like the one right. that Apostolopoulos had the year before, which was exactly. uh, Pretty nasty knee injury, complicated one. But he's back in the B team now. He's training with them, as far as I know. Yeah. There you go. There you guys have it. And then there was another question about some of the other ones uh, from Nolan Lidner Fox. Why don't we try Nicolas, Dabo, or Fadiga? Who is Nicolai? Who, Nicolas was the uh, right back. Who? Osh- Oshira. It's he, like a player that came. Oh, that's. Oh, I'm thinking Nikolic. 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 My bad. Nikolic. Okay, now Nikolic I'm the one is... messing the names up. <laughs> Who is this? I don't. There's so many names these days. This Who's... is like one of those players that we signed from, I think, Bazianina some years ago. He never yes. actually played for us. Yeah. Jesus Christ, I get lost. That, yeah, I he's never going to see time. Dabo... But Fadiga? Where, where is Fadiga, by the way? Is he with the B team in some village, like in Volos, aren't they? Like playing I think a... they're in. Carpenisi, I'm not sure. Carpenisi. Yeah, they're tra- they were training. I saw videos, but I think he is with the... Uh, That's so embarrassing. Imagine you're like the, Fadiga. You came to Olympiacos playing Europe, playing the Champions League. They promise you all this stuff, and you're now in yeah. Carpenisi in August, like playing with 17-year-olds. To, 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 to be honest, mate, like that player, I think he has potential. But if he, he does, doesn't... Put... Like, he should be in the squad, to be honest. He should be in the first yeah. team. Have you, have, you, have you seen how thin he is? Yeah, he's... He's like he's like he's like my little finger. Stick thin. He seriously right. like needs to hit the gym. Needs it's like Karbovnik, man. Or something. The no, wind, no. the wind is gonna blow him away. That yeah. storm. Karbovnik yeah. signed for Dusseldorf in the second division. Interesting yep. story. Because that he demanded dis- uh Brighton were like, we need you to play fullback because Kukorea left, right? This was a big story. And yeah. he was like, I'm not playing fullback anymore, I'm playing in the midfield. Karpovnik said that to Brighton, and they were like, "Well, then you can fuck off." <laughs> so, yeah. Oh, and there was another sorry. Greek player, um, the twenty-year-old kid we got from Lamia, uh, Anestis Vlachomitros. I will not be able to do a deep dive on him. I have literally less than three hundred no minutes. No one of wants to see him. the deep dive of so, Lamia. Like, no one cares. Seen, <laughs> just remi- that just reminded <laughs> yeah, exactly. me. Exactly. Like even just like seeing the pitch of Lamia, you're like, ah. Oh. <laughs> Spe- speaking of deep dives i hope you don't need to do this one uh de la fuente like this is a rumor that came out today uh three times capped by the u.s national team actually i read but i, th- I think he even spent some time at la masia with barcelona but 21 years of age not much experience i saw some f- highlight reel can't even hit the target uh i'm, I'm hoping that's just another one I, that- uh the best comment I saw, um, that, which was from our friend, I won't say who, because it's quite a deflammatory comment, was when you see Olympiacos was winked, linked with a with a winger along with Besiktas and Fenerbahce, you know no <laughs> one has scouted that player and the manager has proposed to him and now the club's interested. Like When you hear like Besiktas, Olympiacos, Fenerbahce, they're all in for this winger, it's like, Definitely, they just have a good manager. Like, no one scouted that player. Like, Fetner, Bache, Olympiacos, and Besiktas all don't have, like, the same scout. It's like, holy shit, this winger is amazing. It's, like, definitely an agent who's like, you want De La Fuentes? 
Fenerbahce, they're like, oh, maybe. Olympiacos, yeah, sure, maybe. We don't have to scout shit, so that sounds good. So <laughs> <laughs> it's like whenever you see, like, it, it, it's with the same with the sporting winger. What's his name again? I said it. Cabral. 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 It's like Cabral's linked with Besiktas and Olympiacos. It's like, for fuck's sake, man. Like, every single winger we want, Besiktas wants. Like, do we have the same scouts as Besiktas? We like share resources. It's like, yeah. Well, Zach V, uh, want to see huge effort from our players on Thursday. I even want to see some Xilo. Guys, I want us to win too much. Look, buddy, or so much. Sorry. I we we're all there with you, buddy. We all want we all want to win. I don't think that's uh I don't think that's a question. We all want this is, win. Is it quite amazing that we're talking about what would be our first win of the season? Yeah. Think about that. Think about that. Will we score more than one goal? We have to. Yeah. I find yeah. it difficult to think how. Well, with our defense, yeah. like, yeah. have we kept a clean sheet all season? No. Um, Official game? No. No, 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 no. Uh, no. Kind of on that note, is it's kind of weird, like, the conversations that we're having. Because remember last year, it was, we're, like, struggling, but we haven't technically, like, lost a match do you guys remember that like we never yes after oh the ludogorets God. they were like we haven't lost a match i remember yet. like nikos kotsis and like todeka gi was like martins is still undefeated in qualifiers it's like well you're undefeated but we're fucking out man like yeah you like, genius like <laughs> fuck me it's like, and now we're here we're like i don't know it's just it's just like funny to think about like the different conversations we're having now versus what it was last year so i don't know that, that that just struck me as hilarious. Also, I think this is a good comment too. Shouldn't like disrespect small places as well. But la me, I just like hold. I don't know. There's something about that. Like, do you remember that game where we played and the ball wouldn't even move like half it was a meter? Flooded. It was, it was flooded. Yes. They were I playing in a hate, swamp. Yeah. I, I hate do playing la Mia. I just hate. Like, I want la Mia. Okay, this is really mean. I want La Mia to get relegated and we just get a club from somewhere else. Like, I'm really tired of going to La Mia and just seeing the worst football pitch you've ever seen. The stadiums in shambles. Anyway, La Mia rants. Like, but he has a point. I mean, think yeah. about like all the great players that we got from Pañonos back in the day. Yeah. yeah. Actually, even my, that's where Masuras came from. Yeah. The so, best academy. Yeah. You know. Yep. It's, yeah, man. Uh, that's, this is so funny. Chumich is still at Olympiacos. It's like incredible the random people. Like Yanis Masuras is still at Olipel. There's like random people that you're like throughout your day and you're just like, oh shit, blah 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 is still at Olipel. Of course, like they're not gone. It's 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 incredible. You just you randomly have um people who are still there. But anyway, that's my main point. Uh, I don't tell you, man. It's look. It's a tough situation. There's a lot of stuff. And there's a lot of stuff that will get worked out. I Honestly, I believe that a lot is focused right now just on getting through these two legs. Yes. And depending what happens tomorrow, whether we win or lose, I think we'll start to see more movement. Tomorrow. Especially – tomorrow. <laughs> us, that, yeah, that's what I meant. Yeah. God, sorry. I need another coffee. It's. But if we go out Thursday, and I know we're probably going to do a preview episode, it's like what do you even say? Like, what do you even say? Just, and I think everyone needs to be ready to um, to go out Thursday. Everyone needs to be ready mentally to... Does, we haven't hit rock bottom yet. Like, there's still let's room. Not, let's not go there yet. Let's not go there yet. There's still room. So, yeah. Let's see. There, there, there was actually a question earlier on in the chat about... Um, would we be happy would we be okay like if we drop down to to conference and i even put that i even put that question in the um, in the poll on the last That's point fine. that we that we conference did conference league is fine this season after this disaster this the is a rebuild question, season the yeah. real question is can we get past the kazakhstan team because then we can't exactly. lose another qualifier exactly exactly like there's a very good chance we go t- we haven't beat anyone this season like are we really better than Kazakhstani teams now? Like, I don't know. Like, wh- I don't even know if they, I didn't know they played football there, to be honest. So, like, now that's what, that's, that's what we've reached. God damn it. That is what we've reached. I'm just, 
<laughs> anyway, um, yeah, that's it. I, I have nothing else really to say tonight, guys. I, I think that's it. Like, yeah. we haven't hit rock bottom yet. That's that's the hopeful message. There's always lower. You know when they say that there's like there's always lower. There's always that's lower. not a that's not a hopeful message. That's an ominous one. Oh, that's a terrible. <laughs> that, that's not a hopeful message. There's always. Yeah, that, that's all I got really. That's like the most hopeful message I've got. Like, um, people are saying like conference would be great. Conference would be fine. Fucking conference is not guaranteed. We still have to like beat a team. This team has not shown any capability to beat a team. So yeah, Kuipers. Jesus Christ, people trolling us that. with Kuipers here. Nolan, you guys know we loved Kuipers. Yeah, man. We two goals, him, two goals in successive weeks, match days. Yeah. Oh, let's it, not this talk is, about. Let's not talk about. This guy's ready to go. Rusty Seven. He's got two bottles of gin next to his TV, prepared for the worst. <laughs> bring out the whiskey, mate. kosla has gotta have to bring out the tickle the air. Yeah, I got that ready too, man. Yeah. Oh. I have I have my mother in law's well I think she I think this is Tipo I have bathroom made. Oh I'm ready to get myself messed up <laughs> if things go poorly. This is an interesting one. From Nikos Del Del. I hope our team's DNA will become again like this statement. I want at the next game Balk fans drop more stones against us so that we score more goals, said Neri Castillo at Tuba. Love oh, it. Legend. Yeah, we def we yeah. need that passion back. We, yeah. yeah, we definitely do. That's for sure. But yeah, yeah. Lambert, I think I'm with you, buddy. That's I've I've said just about everything I have to say at this point. Yeah, in time, Gosta, you got anything else, buddy? No, man. Um, good. We've got the pre we'll probably do a match preview before Thursday. Follow the developments. So, I have we nothing will. more to say today. I think we will. Yeah. Boys and girls, last chance. If you haven't done so already, don't forget, like and subscribe. We got to make this community huge. More red and white fans means a bigger community to support Olympiacos. If they don't have passion on the field, we'll bring the passion for them. So let's do it, boys and girls. Bring the army together of red and white family so that we can make this the best community for football in the world. We got so much stuff coming up. Uh, bet us guys for the betters out there uh, stream we're gonna work continue working on getting streaming options for you guys so that everybody can watch libyakos so continue to watch these spaces and we will continue to get the information out there everything that's coming front office back office field you name it we're looking for that information for you but help us continue to grow this network every like every interaction Helps us with the algorithm, gets us pushed up there. That's for also podcast as well. If you're listening on Spotify, Apple, give us a review, five stars. Tell people about us because you might be able to help the next red and white fan find us and find this family. So until next time, everybody, this is Gate 7 International. By the fans, for the fans. We'll see you next time. Oh, Oh, Pupa, Jésus, la mépa d'agro, 